Hi, welcome to UAM at the Beach. My name is Chris Scotes, the director of the University Art Museum here at Cal State University. And today I have two very special guests, co-curator of the exhibition Picturing Power, Diane Mullen, and the artist Paul Shambrum. This is an exhibition that we started organizing three years ago, and it's already traveled to the University of Minnesota at the Wiseman Museum of Art. It's gone to Atlanta at the Atlanta Center for Contemporary Art, and currently is now at the University Art Museum. It's an exhibition that's a mid-career survey of Paul's work and covers about 20 years of, of, of practice and there are five bodies of work. So we should start by talking about the first two bodies of work which open the exhibition, Factories and Offices. So, and Paul, if you can describe for our viewers the work and the reasons for taking the photographs to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, the Factory series uh, came out of my earlier experience doing commercial photography where I was working in industrial environments. And um, you'll see in the photographs, they're not your typical kind of corporate advertising pictures. They um, show the clutter, the chaos, the sort of visual environment um, that was very interesting to me and I didn't feel had been really explored before photographically. And these pictures are taken at uh, factories all across the country, is that right? Yes, including several right here in, in uh, Southern California. So we have steel factories, we have other service industries that are photographed, um, computer um, factories and so forth, is that right? Yeah, it's a mix of the old kind of heavy industry, you know, the hot metal kind of industries, and uh, the newer, at least at the time, they were newer industries of medical technology and computer technology and aerospace. And how did you go about choosing these particular places? Um, well, research has always been a really important part of my practice. And uh, you know, this work spans a period, as you said, of over 20 years. So at that point, the research was not computer-based. Uh, it was just finding out where the various industries were located and working on access, which is another Right. Kind of an important part of what I do. And gaining access to these particular places was easy to do? No, it's never easy. Um, it involved writing letters to the corporations and finding out who the decision makers were and kind of pleading my case. Uh, they're, they're used to having journalists and, and media photographers come in and I described myself as I still do as an artist photographer and I, I think uh, perhaps we were considered less threatening as, as an artist, you know, we sort of, I was able to sort of slide in under the radar, radar um, with the decision makers at these places. And when you took these photographs, did it take a lot of equipment? I mean, was it uh, um, a lot technical, um, was it 4 by 5 camera, was it a, how did you do these pictures, how did you set these pictures? Um, that series and, and the earlier series were done with a medium format camera. I tried to keep my working method fairly simple without a lot of extra lighting gear or assistance or, you know, a lot of the trappings that I would have had with me for commercial assignments. This is very different. I just wanted to be able to, you know, wander freely and, and respond, you know, quickly intuitive and intuitively to the environments. From the factories and offices we move into the nuclear weapons series. Now gaining access to those particular sites must have been particularly difficult. You shot most of these photographs before 9-11. Mm -hmm. But and I know there's a lot of uh, work that went into gaining access. Why don't you talk to our viewers about how, how you begin to set the work up and why you move from uh, shooting offices and factories mm -hmm. around the country to the the nuclear weapons series. By that point, um, the theme of power had developed in my work, and I was knew that I was interested, particularly American forms of power, and uh, in some ways, nuclear weapons. You know, were literally the the most powerful aspect of America. Um, you know, it kind of props up our foreign policy. Uh, our military might is backed by nuclear weapons. Uh, and so it, it seemed like the obvious next step. And it was kind of a ridiculous idea because it was, was so difficult to get access. I, you know, I'm, I'm glad I didn't talk myself out of it at the time. Um, you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss, I guess. So I took some of the skills that I had developed uh, with research and requesting access with the factory and office work and uh, just applied that to trying to learn about military culture, which I didn't have any background or, or, or basis in. I'd never served in the military. Uh, so I just learned as much as I could about how decisions are made, about um, 
what information is publicly available on nuclear weapons, and a lot of it is legally and publicly available. Things are much easier now, of course, with the internet. Um, the research I was doing then was all library and, and book-based. Um, and I was very patient and persistent. I, I had some advantages that a magazine or news photographer wouldn't have, and one is that I, I had a lot of time. I didn't really have deadlines. So some of these places, it, it took years. And the very first visit I made uh, to an Air Force base took two years of research and negotiations before I was even given permission for that. So how many years did the, does this body of works cover? For photography, it goes from 1992 to 2001, and then two years of research prior to that. So the temporal book ends on, on the beginning is uh, the ending of the Cold War, which, depending on how you measure, is 89, 90, 91. And then the last photographs were taken in August of 2001, which, not by design, of course, but that was uh, one month prior to the attacks of September 11th. And tell us, uh, give us a couple of stories about uh, access or what happened when you went to these places. And yeah, I know you were followed uh, very closely by mm -hmm. military personnel. So give us a little bit of a, a background, or, or sure. a bit of a background to that. Yeah, I was always escorted by uh, a public affairs officer, uh, usually from, most of the work I did was either in Air Force or, or Navy facilities. and. Uh, Everything was a negotiation. You know, often I would be in a room where there were things that were classified that I could see them, but I wasn't allowed to photograph them. And, and the whole subject of classification is very complicated. It, it's something that um, it, it's fairly abstract. I couldn't really understand why this widget is classified and that one isn't. So there was always an expert there to kind of explain it. And often he or she would, you know, get on the phone and find out, okay, you can look there but you can't look there. Did you ever uh, try and sneak a photograph that was of, of classified material? Uh, no, no. Um, and they did, they checked the photographs, right, as you? Sometimes. Um, that was the, the deal I had to make uh, for some of the spaces was that they would only allow me to work in those places if I agreed to let them process and review the film. And that's something that a, a journalist, a photojournalist, would never agree to. But, you know, I wasn't really subject to those rules. Several of the pictures that we have in the museum uh, are from the, a submarine. Mm -hmm. And we obviously, because of the space requirements of the exhibition, don't have the whole series or the whole body of work from the nuclear weapons. So talk a little bit about the, the depth of the, or the breadth of the, of the project in general. Well, it ended up being a, a fairly encyclopedic look at the current state of the uh, American nuclear arsenal at the end of the Cold War. Uh, the parameters were that I was only going to photograph current weapons, not historic uh, weapons. And I really wasn't going to do the laboratories or the manufacturing uh, part of, of the whole nuclear infrastructure. Uh, so within that, um, there are submarines and uh, missiles and bombers as, as delivery systems for these weapons. And so I, I tried to pretty much create a, an, a, an educational body of work where a citizen could look through these pictures and read the text and, and get a pretty good overview of how the uh, U.S. nuclear arsenal is structured. Do you think that, uh, that uh, post 9-11 you have an interest in going back? Uh, I know you know that it's difficult to do that, but you mm -hmm. have, do you have interest in going back and sort of reinvestigating the same territory now and seeing what's different? No, I'm pretty much on, on to new and different things, and, and, and I know that uh, things haven't changed much uh, with nuclear uh, levels of armament and the particulars, the particular weapons. There are, there are much uh, less weapons in number now than there were. And um, I'm, I'm a little hesitant to throw out numbers because they're not going to sure. be exact. But r roughly at the time I started this work, at the end of the Cold War, there were about 10,000 active warheads on the U.S. side. And I think now we're down to about 3,000. It depends on how you count. Um, so there, there are uh, far fewer, but the particular weapon systems are all still in place. The Trident submarine, uh, the B-2 and the B-52 bomber, uh, the Minuteman missile are all still in place and, and on full alert status, uh, much as they were during the, cold, the height of the Cold War. There's still men and women down in the underground launch control chambers for the, the missiles, you know, with their fingers on the buttons, read, ready to go. 
Now, your, the work about, around nuclear weapons is, um, there are many photographers, or some, some photographers who have, have looked at this material, and there have been uh, exhibitions that look at the, the breadth of this kind of investigation. Do you guys hang out together? Do you talk about this work? How, does, how do you communicate with other people who are working with the same material? Uh, well, yeah, we, we've all been in touch over the years. There, there's sort of a, a loosely affiliated uh, organization called the Atomic Photographers Guild. I mean, we never meet or really do anything, but it's, and, and I can't tell you too much about it because it's all very secret. But, it is uh, very secret? Well, it, it, it's so secret that we don't even know what, what we do or what it's for. That's how secret it is. Um, but th th this is work that I, I finished in uh, 2001, so mm -hmm. I, I'm not actively pursuing that anymore, but I'm still in touch with uh, some of the photographers. Now there's a big break, I think, in the in your um, body of work, and we the next series that the visitors to the museum will see are, are meetings. Right. Did right. I was going to say you you enjoyed a lot of success. I mean, those the nuclear weapons were seen, published mm -hmm. a book, and then the next things that came out were images that you worked on, or images of uh, small town municipal meetings. Can you sort of talk us through how you came to the decision to go from that mm -hmm. to this, and how they seemed unrelated at, to some? Well, they're, they're very different visually, I think, thematically. Yeah. They're related in, in that they're about power. Towards the end of my work with nuclear weapons, I became kind of obsessed with the whole command and control aspect, the idea that there are human beings that are making decisions on if and how these weapons are going to be used. And it got me thinking a lot about the whole process of, of human decision making. And of course, the central activity for that is generally a meeting. Um, in the nuclear weapons series, I photographed some uh, command centers and conference tables. Um, so the logical next step for me was to look at another type of power, which is um, governmental power on a very small local level. And that, that's what led me directly into the meetings project. Okay. Well, one other thing that happened there too, though, is you changed, well, you worked with digital photography, which I just would like to hear you talk a little bit about. There's a lot of discussion about it. It mm -hmm. looked too painterly, and I'm wondering if you could sort of comment on that. Well, to date, I, I'm still photographing with film. The um, prints I'm making are, are digital. Okay. And, I, you know, I don't see it as really a, a, a revolutionary change. It's, it's more just a, a different set of tools to use. And do you think that's when your, um, the relationship of your photographs to painting seems very present in those meetings pictures? And maybe it's earlier, but do you think it really really dug in there. I'm going to ask Paul to hold that thought. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back on the other side and we're going to talk more about the meeting series and then talk more about your current work, Homeland Security. We'll be right back. The facts are in. California State University Long Beach is among the nation's finest universities. For the fourth consecutive year, the campus ranked in the top five public comprehensive universities in the Western United States. In 2007, Cal State Long Beach was named the third best value among all American public colleges and universities. A survey by the National Science Foundation rated Cal State Long Beach first in the nation for the number of graduates who then go on to earn doctoral degrees in science and engineering. Offering full scholarships to high school valedictorians and national merit scholars, Cal State Long Beach sponsors the premier President's Scholars Program in California. Through superior teaching, research, creative activity, and community service, California State University Long Beach operates as a student-centered, globally engaged public university, changing lives for a changing world. Welcome back to UAM at the Beach, and I'm here with two very special guests, Diane Mullen, who is the co-curator on the exhibition Picturing Power and the artist Paul Shambroom. This exhibition is currently on at the University Art Museum and will be on, ex on exhibit through April. So please stop by the museum and see this incredible show. And before the break, we were talking about Paul's meeting series. And Diane, we we'll pick up from where we left off. Right, we were talking about the process. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if, you, if there's more you want to wrap up or explain, I mean, what it was. You're saying mm -hmm. it wasn't digital photography, but inkjet printed. Um, is, is there more you want to 
Well, sure. At, yeah, it, sure. at that point, um, I changed the process of making prints from traditional uh, what is called a color C print, which is a regular chemical print, to working with digital output. And it's only significant in that it allowed me to um, kind of play with the idea of a painting and the art historical references to painting. So I was using um, some digital manipulation on the photographs uh, to selectively soften and sharpen some areas and to do some things with the color. And they're also uh, printed on canvas. They're inkjet prints on canvas, that particular series. And in the, in, I, I think you start to see in those a painterly precedence, if not, not to be too art historical. I mean, mm -hmm. thinking about paintings as precedents. Um, can, mm -hmm. can you comment on that? Looking at the, the composition, I guess, is what sure. I mean. Yeah. Well, you know, there's a, a long and great uh, tradition of uh, portraying the powerful hmm. um, in art and, and through paintings. So there are some compositional elements. You know, the, the one that I think is sort of overriding is Da Vinci's Last Supper, which is uh, a table with important people having a meeting, uh, essentially. And I didn't initially set out to emulate that style, but I, I think it was pretty subconsciously in, ingrained in, in me that, okay, that this is the, the best way to portray this. You know, the meetings have another relationship to the nuclear weapons, which is the process of not necessarily access, but you know, how did you decide, what are the parameters you set up on this project? And there was some travel and mm -hmm. some, some kind of legwork. Can you sort of describe that? Sure. Um, for the meeting series, I traveled all over the country. I think I visited uh, 35 states and photographed uh, 150 different meetings over the course of about six years. I found that the smaller communities were more interesting visually, so I didn't adhere to it strictly, but I set a parameter of communities of 2,000 people or less. Mm -hmm. I found that the communities expressed their personality a, a little bit more directly in the smaller towns. And there are a lot of theatrical aspects to um, how community meetings are held. There's a set of sorts where there are conscious decisions made about what's going to be the backdrop of the set, the tables, the chairs. Um, there's uh, a program, which is uh, the agenda for the meeting. And then there are, there's the cast, which are the uh, community members that have made the decision to run for elective office. And they are, uh, you know, they're not professional politicians. Uh, they're well, tell just us about the agenda for some yeah. of these meetings, because this is not de this is democracy at the other end of the scale. I mean, we're used to right now seeing uh, all of the issues with Obama and the White House and the mm -hmm. big scale of bailouts and uh, stimulus plans. And mm -hmm. At yeah. the uh, other end of the scale with these meetings, the, the agendas were completely different. Yeah, they were dealing with issues like uh, stop signs, um, hiring the first police officer that the town has ever had, <laughs> mm -hmm. and whether that police officer would be able to pay for his or her salary by issuing enough speeding tickets, um, insurance issues, replacing a broken park bench, things that, that seem very small but are very significant um, for residents of, of a community. And we should say there's a book, a book that has been published on the right. meetings that, that include all of the notes from each of the individual means with the photographs, which I think act, gives a lot more in background information to the photographs, which then brings it all into a slightly different context. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's a, a book published by uh, Chris Boot, who's mm -hmm. a British publisher in uh, 2004, and that book is still available. Mm -hmm. There are 40 pictures in it, and the back of the book has the full and complete minutes for each of those 40 meetings. And I, I just find those very interesting to read. It's kind of like found poetry, the, the language that the communities choose to describe the proceedings. It, it's really all in their own words. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. It's actually yeah. really fun reading. So. It is. Well, Diane, anything else about the meetings? Or? Well, I, and one, one last question for you is, um, you, you did, how did, I should say, did you go on your own? I mean, unlike the nuclear weapons, what was gaining access? to those. I mean, we didn't mm -hmm. talk about that, and I know that's a part of it. Like, how did you get into those meetings? Well, the, the access is, is very simple for uh, public meetings in, in this country. Every state has a, it's called a sunshine law mm -hmm. that requires that meetings be open to the public. There were occasional segments if they were talking about a personnel issue where 
they would ask the visitors to leave. But I, I didn't need permission. I always asked as a courtesy, and I, I called ahead. Often in this, the small towns, um, I would be the only visitor at the meeting. Wow. Um, yeah. And people were, you know, very surprised. I think they thought I was kind of nuts to be doing <laughs> this project because most people don't like going to meetings, you know. And I was, you know, purposely setting aside years of my time and driving hundreds of miles to attend their meetings. So they thought I was a little bit crazy. But yeah. people like it when you pay attention to them. Uh, if you're respectful and if you're interested in what they're doing. And, and that type of work of government on that level is generally pretty unsung. I mean, people don't say thank you very often. True. Mm -hmm. well, uh, and did you find uh, any reason, I mean, did you have stories of resistance or people saying we really don't want you photographing or did, um, with that project or it went very, pretty Very few. I think out of the 150, there were two or three times when I would call and they were reluctant or they, you know, outright said, no, we don't want this. And usually I respected that. <laughs> Occasionally yeah. I would think, hmm, there must be something very interesting going on there if they don't want me there. But I'm not a very confrontational yeah. guy. We're um, talking about not wanting you. The next series right. that you've that you embarked on is the Homeland Security series. And I think one of the interesting transitions between the meetings and the Homeland Security is this idea of portraiture. Mm -hmm. that is addressed in the meeting series. We talked a little bit about uh, art historical reference to um, The Last Supper. But you also spent time before you started shooting the, Ho the Homeland Security series looking at the history of portraiture. And I know you spent some time at the National Portrait Gallery in London mm -hmm. and looking at paintings of the privileged. Um, and there's something very interesting because there were three amazing portraits in the Homeland Security with uh, guy, uh, guys in hazmat suits and um, so forth, and they're set in a very bucolic mm -hmm. landscape, not unlike some of those 18th and 19th century portraits you, you might see at the National Portrait Gallery. So as a form of transition, let's talk a little bit about the Homeland Security work and those portraits and, and where that body of work is, is, is led. In that series, I, I did kind of step outside of the documentary tradition. The, the portraits do have a, a very uh, clear sense of artifice to them. Mm -hmm. um, they're artificially lit. Um, and you, you'll see that the figures are in natural settings, but there's something kind of not quite real right about them. Right. And um, that decision was for a couple of reasons. That kind of strategic artistic decision on my part was to um, make reference to uh, the traditions of, of painting of the powerful. Mm -hmm. um, painters like uh, Joshua Reynolds or Gainsborough or, or the American uh, Gilbert Stewart that did the famous full-length portraits of George Washington. If you look closely at those, you'll see the, the light, even in the 18th and 19th century paintings, um, it's a little bit at odds. It doesn't make sense. The light on the figure doesn't match the light in the background, in the landscape, where there's usually a right. dramatic storm brewing up or something. And so I wanted to make reference to that um, with how I photograph these figures. And the other uh, reason had to do with the question of reality and what, what's real and what's false. And that was something that was very much on my mind and I think very much in the air um, after 9-11 and in the build-up to um, the second Iraq war. You know, questions about weapons of mass destruction or are they real or are they not real? And issues of fear, you know, what should, what should we be afraid of? What, you know, and the, and the other pictures, uh, other than the portraits, deal with sort of training camps, right, uh, so to yeah. speak, of, uh, for, the, for the military and for uh, special forces. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about, if you can, those, those photographs, because they add a nice sort of balance to these large-scale, almost life-size life portraits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, photographed in, I think, about five different training centers around the country. Uh, where there are simulations, simulated environments um, that are towns or communities uh, where they train first responders. And that was, uh, again, to make reference to the question about what's real and what's not real. I want you real. to talk about one particular photograph. So I think this, the okay. one we talked about last night and that the, the government purchased a small town. Yeah, it's uh, Playas, New Mexico, which uh, has the, the trademark name of uh, Terror Town. Uh, was purchased by with funds from the Department of Homeland Security. It was at one time a functioning community with a thousand residents and now the buildings, the school, the bank 
are all used for uh, training purposes. And the photograph uh, you're referring to in the show has a SWAT team approaching a little adobe uh, <laughs> residence. Inside the residence are uh, some former t townspeople that now are employed by uh, New Mexico yeah. Tech, which runs the facility. And they do role playing. They pretend that they're hostages or they pretend that they're terrorists. Right. Um, One of my favorite pictures in the show, I think. But before we run out of time, I, I want to give you an opportunity to talk about some of the newer photographs you're taking that aren't in the exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, and it's called Shrines. Yes. Right? Yeah, and there is a little, little preview in the exhibition on a monitor. Um, I'm photographing uh, weapons that are on public display. Uh, things like tanks and helicopters and airplanes, not in museums or aerospace parks, but are there, that are within community centers, uh, town squares, VFWs, American Legion halls. And it, it's very related to some of the themes I've explored earlier about militarism uh, in American society and uh, war at home, you know, how we deal with those and subjects. Do you have plans to put these on exhibit anytime soon? N um, not real soon. I'll probably be working on that project for the rest of this year, and I hope to do a book and, and exhibits. How many photographs currently have you taken in that series? Oh, I think I photographed uh, well over a hundred different uh, weapons displays across the country. I, as usual, being obsessive compulsive in my, my research. And while um, you're here in California, you're continuing to take photographs? Yes. Of yeah, there, there's a lot here in, in um, the Southern California area, particularly because of the aerospace industries. There's a lot of what we call uh, planes on poles, POPs. <laughs> you can you can find on, on the internet if you uh, Google POP, you'll find huge lists of uh, planes on a stick. So if you mm. are traveling around and uh, our viewers may see Paul photographing planes on poles, mm -hmm. don't be afraid. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for listening and, and being with us, uh, Paul and Diane. And this is University Art Museum at the beach. And please come by the museum, see the show Picturing Power. It, it is on display, just open. It's on display for another about nine weeks, so this is a great show, much to look at, much to think about, and many important issues that relate to today. And uh, thanks guys for being here. Thanks for having us. Thank